Let's hear now, though, from our second speaker for the motion, Fahana Yamin. She's an international environmental lawyer and activist with Extinction Rebellion. She was a negotiator on the Paris Agreement with the small island states. In April last year, she was arrested after gluing herself to Shell's headquarters. And she's a co-author of This Is Not A Drill, an Extinction Rebellion Handbook. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. There's a lot in what Adair Turner has said that I agree with, and we must accept that the solutions to preventing climate chaos, preventing climate carnage, actually exist. They exist today. Most of the technologies that we need to use to bring emissions under control exist today. I think what capitalism doesn't do is deal with the social injustices that are already happening with the global warming that we've committed to and that will continue to rise should we also miss the 1.5 degree target and go overshooting beyond that. At the moment, we have a kind of capitalism that does not look after any of us. It doesn't look after the people in the UK. It doesn't look after the people overseas. It doesn't look after the planet. It does not look after nature. So I feel that maybe to add to George's definition of capitalism, a simple way is maybe to see capitalism as a pyramid of extraction. That's what capitalism is. It's a pyramid where people and nature are at the bottom and profits and wealth and power accumulate towards the top. They've accumulated in such obscene quantities that they threaten the very nature of our democ democracies. There used to be a tenuous kind of link between um, capitalism and democracy, but actually that link isn't really true. And if anything, that link is going in the reverse direction. So why did I um, choose to speak for this motion? Why did I choose to join the rebels back in April? Um, I've got two books here, and it's not because I want you to buy them and sell them. I, and buy this one, by the way, because all the profits go. I want you to, to... This is a climate change and carbon markets book that I wrote and came out in 2005. We spent the first decade of my life as a climate change lawyer negotiating the UNFCCC, the Climate Convention, and then the Kyoto Protocol. And Kyoto Protocol gave rise to carbon markets, which were also developed in the European Union. So I've got quite a lot of um, you know, history of being um, into the very kinds of regulations, the very kinds of incentives, the very kinds of market mechanisms that uh, Adair has said can constrain capitalism, can constrain and control pollution. And I, 20, 30 years later, I have to say, those mechanisms do not work. They don't work. All of the experts now agree that using emissions trading for a structural problem like climate change does not work. We're not talking about an end of pipe, what we call, you know, fix it solution, a technology that we can just use uh, a, a, and ask uh, power, power stations, for example, to bolt on in the way they did with sulfur. We're asking for an entire rejigging of the global economy of every country's energy system, of every country's agricultural system, of every country's transport system, of every citizen's aspirational desires. That is what we call a systemic challenge. That is the carbon economy that we need to change, and we cannot regulate it simply by looking at all the technologies that are available and saying somehow magically the system will adopt them. I think the... F the the, the, my disillusion slightly, you know, intellectual as it was, um, with the kinds of mechanisms that we were being uh, uh, urged to, 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 to put forward as solutions, really came to a head as it became more and more clear that the influence, the power, the preponderance political power of the biggest corporations in the world, all of which trade in, in carbon-intensive products, oil, gas, coal, um, you name it, those are the biggest ones. Those companies, uh, whether they're state-owned or privately owned, those were lobbying and uh, 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 
controlling the sort of narrative and greenwashing and actually heavily influencing the way in which elections take place. You see that very clearly behind the scenes if you're a day-to-day -day lawyer, uh, as I have been in the, in the climate regime. You see uh, regulations being vetoed, watered down. You see permits that were meant to be constrained given out for free uh, being given out in excess, which means that none of these mechanisms really worked. Um, my final um, uh, trigger for gluing myself to Shell was really a report that came out uh, which said that since the signing of the Paris Agreement in 2015, one billion dollars had been spent by the top five oil companies in the world on lobbying and marketing and greenwashing. That was, um, for me, a really important sense of outrage that I felt. I don't know if you can see this here, but this is like a... I don't know if you can see this tiny sliver. You know, if someone served you that as a cake slice, it wouldn't be a slice, it would be a sliver. That little tiny orange sliver is the slice of funding by the oil majors that goes into low carbon and green sources of energy. All of the rest, this is a 2019 figures, goes into still digging out, exploring, uh, and producing yet more fossil fuels. The scale of this uh, destruction is immense. Um, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Aramco, which is the largest, most profitable company in the entire world, um, produces uh, profits of around $3,000 per second, uh, around $300 million per day. So trying to control and regulate companies as large as that essentially is a geopolitical challenge. It is not a technological challenge. We have to find a different system for constraining uh, these sorts of uh, dynamics. And I feel that's what we haven't really understood. I want very much to say that there is a level playing field and somehow the new technologies that Adair has talked about, which are there, most of them, by the way, will emerge. They won't. They won't because the largest share of government handouts, what we call fossil fuel subsidies, just call them for what they are, government handouts, are being paid to fossil fuel companies still because they have political power and control. The scale of those subsidies is mind-boggling. So there's two ways of counting these subsidies. If you include the cost of actual damage, they come to like five trillion dollars. That's an obscenely huge amount. That means that these companies are being uh, supported by governments and they have taken control of the economy in ways that does not lend itself uh, to a sort of reformist mindset. That's why I think the um, young people and um, people who are really active in, in, in politics are coming up with much more radical solutions. So I don't want to leave you with a lack of hope and lack of alternatives. I think big business, especially big business and finance, the UK is the heart of the global finance uh, uh, industry, are, need to be absolutely controlled with regulation. We need to say, stop funding and financing these activities. We need to say to our governments very clearly, stop using taxpayers' money to support and subsidize these same industries. We need to say to the CEOs of these companies and the finance industry, you are failing humanity. We have to make very clear that what they're leaving us with is the challenge, especially to younger people, of reversing this cat cataclysmic um, breakdown. They're leaving the burden of coping emotionally, physically, mentally, and rebuilding institutions of trust because young people and people uh, all over this country, especially those who have not gained from globalization, not gained from capitalism, no longer trust governments and no longer believe that we can uh, uh, um, bring prosperity in the way that they uh, have been led to expect. I think it's very important to accept that the public actually have a visceral understanding of the failings of capitalism and have already rejected it. That's what's happening in up and down uh, the world, whether you look at the 
the Chilean uh, uh, miners who have uh, rejected, and the people in Chile who turned out in their millions, the Gilets Jaunes, you know, there's a, the student strikers. Uh, everywhere you look, there is an outcry and a desire and an appetite for a huge amount of change. Um, I think what would really help is a structural 10-year plan. Uh, you can call it the Green New Deal, the Nature New Deal, something like the Marshall Plan that was uh, uh, done after the Second World War, to bring together, to bring societies together, to look globally, and to make sure that we put in place a system which is akin to the National Health Service. And I would call it the Natural Health Service is what we now need for the whole planet. Thank you.